Well, good morning, church. Today we continue in our Perspectives series by taking a look at the perspectives and continue as we look at what unfolded around the characters in the Advent story. Because I think that there's a lot we can learn when we look at how they might have felt or how their experiences helped to shape the story. Now remember, we're not putting words into their mouths, but rather looking at the words on the page to see what we can gain from them. And today we're going to check out the perspective of the shepherds. Now there was a time in ancient Israel where shepherding was highly regarded, but throughout their history, beginning with the Egyptian exile, the Israelites began to hold shepherds in lower regard. Now King David came along, and because he was a shepherd... He kind of became a hero to the shepherds in his day. But then by the time Jesus had arrived on earth, shepherding had not just lost its widespread appeal, but it eventually forfeited its social acceptability. Some shepherds earned their poor reputations, but others became victims of a cruel stereotype. Isn't it interesting that these people, among the lowest ranks of society, were among the first to receive an invitation to see the new king. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Now, Mary and Joseph had traveled to Bethlehem in order that they might register for the Roman census. And while they were there, Mary went into labor. And the couple secured a spot in a barn where they were able to give birth to their child. And upon his birth, the angels delivered the first birth announcement, which is where we pick up the story. And I'll read verses 8 through 15. Hear these words. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. This was the case with Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph. An angel appeared to the shepherds and immediately says, do not be afraid. Now, who in the world knows what these angels might have looked like, but we do know that their presence instilled some type of fear in nearly every character within the Advent story. In this particular instance, the shepherds are out in their fields, some time in the overnight hours. Now, they might have slept during the day. Maybe they worked night shift and they were accustomed to that. Or perhaps they were in this dazed state trying to keep their eyes open and keep watch over the flock. The angel appeared, informed them of good news, of great joy for all the people, saying, For unto them and unto the world in the city of David that a child had been born, who was Savior, Messiah the Lord. The angel also told them, that they would find this child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. We don't know much about the perspective of the shepherds. We know that they were likely frightened by the appearance of the angel and that they received directions as to where they might find the child. They also witnessed a heavenly choir with an angel singing God's praise and touting peace on earth. The one thing we know for sure, according to the words on the page, is that after having received instructions on where to find the child, they immediately decided to go and see him. There's an expression used for someone who willingly gives in to something without knowing the outcome. It's called blind faith. This means that we go into uncharted territory or unknown territory, having the faith The situation is going to work out in some way that we would perceive as beneficial. But the end result isn't guaranteed. Unlike Zechariah or Joseph, the shepherds didn't hesitate. They didn't question the circumstances. They received the message and they went willingly. 
This idea of people willingly following the message from a heavenly being, it's not a new concept in scripture. In fact, the, the calling of the shepherds to go see the Christ child actually foreshadows the calling of Jesus' disciples. We know from scripture that Jesus called Peter away from his boat from, from fishing for fish to fishing for lost souls. And that Peter left his boat and went without question. With little exception, the disciples accepted the invitation to follow Jesus. And one of my favorite call stories of the disciples, it comes from the Gospel of John chapter 1. Now John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples and Jesus walks by. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and then they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned around and saw him following him, he said to them, what are you looking for? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said, come and see. It's the way it works with faith. We're invited to come and see. The shepherds were invited to go to Bethlehem and see what God had done. The disciples were all invited to come and see what Jesus was going to do. The invitation to come and see, unless you're a serious risk taker, is hard for us. I know that just jumping head first into something without knowing what it's going to require, how long it's going to last, or what the end outcome might be, is very anxiety producing for me. I'm not someone who enjoys taking significant risks, and yet I know that that's precisely at times what my faith calls me to do. Sometimes I go and I follow the call of God willingly. Sometimes I try to ignore it until God forces me to go, and other times I go kicking and screaming, throwing an adult temper tantrum because I don't like the risk. Unlike Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, or the shepherds, or even the disciples, we have an advantage because we know how the story ends. These folks ultimately followed God's plan. They chose to hop on board and see what might come. And as a result, God's plan for salvation came to fruition. No one who cooperated in the Advent story knew what was going to happen. But we do. They followed the invitation to engage in the movement of God. And we received that same invitation to come and see. But we know where faith leads us. Peace that passes understanding, hope of life eternal, a community of people that we can share in this journey of faith with, the capacity to love in ways that we never thought possible, a journey like no other. Even still, we struggle. We wrestle with doubt. We have questions. We want to know the outcome before we delve into a new ministry project or initiative. The truth of the matter is, we're not always going to have the answer. And we might get it wrong from time to time. Even still, when we mess up, don't give up. We take a look at what happened, course correct, and we get back to it. Faith kind of requires a trust and an ability that isn't our own, but rather in the ability of God to lead us as we work to share the good news of great joy that unto us a Savior was born. And that's news that we're called to share with every man, every woman, every child. Or simply to extend the invitation to come and see what God has done. We're going to come back to that thought, but I want to shift our perspective a bit. As already mentioned, the shepherds were among the lowest rungs in society. And it's also known that Jesus called some of the lowliest and most despised people within society to be among his inner circle namely fishermen and a tax collector. And throughout his time in ministry, he continually sought out those that society loved to hate, and he offered them grace and forgiveness and compassion and love. You see, I think it's fitting that the shepherds were the first to hear about Jesus' birth because it's precisely the reason that he came. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, Jesus is teaching a crowd, and, and he says, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. 
They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. In other words, Jesus claimed there are plenty of people who had the religion thing figured out. They knew the law. They followed it to the letter. They tried to keep other people bound by it. They enjoyed the prominence that their position offered to them. And yet Jesus taught something radically different. He said faith isn't about being the most religious, nor did faith grow by doing more religious things. Faith was about humility, offering one's service and compassion to others. He had the same advice when James and John, two of his disciples, questioned him about where they were going to be when they got into heaven because they wanted to be right next to him. And then the other disciples, they got angry. And Jesus reminds them in Mark chapter 10, he says, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, they lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. For whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When Jesus arrived on earth, there was something called messianic expectation. Everyone expected Messiah was going to overthrow Rome and restore the state of Israel. Jesus came proclaiming a different message, a message of peace, a message of compassion, a message of humility, a message of hope, a message of love. You see, he didn't come to restore one generation. He came to restore every generation that would ever set foot on earth. So let's put this into perspective a bit. The model from Jesus is that the lowly were lifted up, that the lofty were brought down from their pedestals. There is no reason to believe that he wouldn't do the exact same thing today. And yet so often, especially at Christmas, we, we seek to hold the position of honor by having the best or the most or giving the most or buying the best stuff to give away instead of trying to give the best or ensure that our own wish lists are fulfilled making this season all about us Jesus called us to be the best we can be in order to offer our best to others that they might come and see we make judgments about the type of people who might be receiving aid or help with meals or help with buying gifts for the season now we might not condemn them but we might question their circumstance. Maybe we feel sorry for them. But instead of considering their circumstance, Jesus calls us to just consider their humanity. Invite them to come and see. It's easy with the mall and congested hallways and, and aisleways and stores and all the holiday traffic at the airports or on the freeways to get frustrated and aggravated with drivers or people who cut in line ahead of us. We might get frustrated with a stressed out ticket agent or a store clerk. Jesus calls us not to see others as an obstacle to the accomplishment of our goal, but rather as a person with their own mission, their own goal. Maybe it's a person who needs to earn a living. Maybe it's a person who so often is viewed by others as an obstacle that they might simply need to be reminded that someone appreciates them and what they do. To see them as a person who might need to be reminded that they too share in the invitation to come and see. See, there's one message that rings true within Scripture, especially in the New Testament. It doesn't matter whether it's Jew or Greek, slave or free, man or woman, adult or child or any other identity marker. Jesus came for all. And all are invited to come and see this great thing that God has done. Sometimes we're called to invite someone to come and see. And we might not ever know if they went and saw. Or whether they went somewhere else to see. What we can do is plant a seed. So that maybe once enough invitations are extended, they might choose to go and see. 
to hear the good news and accept it for themselves. Just like faith is sometimes going to lead us into uncharted territory, we never know when God might use us to introduce someone else to the journey of a lifetime. Sometimes we're going to go in blind. We're going to get that earth-shaking call to go and see or to share. And we just have to trust that God has been and will continue to be faithful when we follow that call. So often we romanticize the birth of Jesus, but we know that there was nothing romantic about it. What we don't often think about is the fact that the lowliest people in society were the first to receive the birth announcement of the Christ child. What might that mean for us? Throughout his ministry, Jesus made it a point to visit the least of these, teaching us a new example and a new type of power and strength, one of service, one of humility. By coming to the world in the worst of circumstances, Jesus showed us that the good news of great joy was for everyone. He taught us that people are not objects, that people are people with real fears and real insecurities, with real hopes and real dreams, with the same capacity to give and receive love. He has invited all of us to come and to see what God has done as we join in the work of the kingdom, to see what God could do through us in the world today. So my prayer, is that we would commit ourselves this Advent and always to extend the invitation to others to come and see what God has done, that we too would receive this invitation, that we ourselves might come and see what God has done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the Christ child, and for the opportunity that his life, death, and resurrection offers to each of us. Help us to not only come and see for ourselves, but to invite others to come and see as well. We know you are a God who is faithful and trust that you will fulfill your promises in and through us. Help us to recognize that we may not always know where you are taking us, but that is what faith is all about. This we pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And my friends, as we go this day, may we go to extend the invitation to others to come and see what God has done among us. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and be with you always. We'll see you next week.